So now not only do you have less of that sleepy chemical because you just took that power nap, but you're also blocking that sleepy chemical that you have with your caffeine. So it's a little... I love that. That is what we call gold. (laughs) (laughs) We are Gold Ivy, a health company dedicated to simplifying health and wellness. The industry is lacking the honest experience and grit required to overcome the struggle. And we're here to fill that gap. You decide what works for your daily life and how to transform our lessons into your gold. Join us on the fearless pursuit of self-discovery and growth. This is Ivy Unleashed, a Gold Ivy production. Welcome back. You are listening to Ivy Unleashed. As always, we are so grateful that you are here with us today. Welcome. Today is a very, very exciting day because we have in studio our first ever doctor on the show. Yes. A lot of you guys know my story and how familiar I am with doctors. However, uh, unlike what I've shared before, I am so excited to pick the brain of this doctor because today we're covering a topic that everyone wants more of, something that we can't get enough of, we stress about, we crave. Mm -hmm. Uh, But before we jump in, I just want to note, little disclaimer, the information that you hear today should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for informational purposes only, and because each person is so unique, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. All right, so let's get into it. I want to introduce to you, everybody, Dr. Ron of Internal Medicine at the University of Minnesota, or can we call you Dr. Danielle? You can just call me Danielle. I feel like, you know, we're friends talking about stuff that's like fun to talk about and will improve our lives, so... um, Danielle's fine with me. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. I think, as Brooke was saying, this is a topic that we haven't jumped fully into yet, Mm -hmm. and it's a topic that everybody's asking for us to cover, which we planned on anyway, but it's like, okay, we hear you. We are going to be talking about... (laughs) And we're going to bring a doctor in to talk about sleep. (laughs) About sleep. (laughs) I know that sleep is a passion of yours, so how did you get interested in it? Well, um... Being a doctor and training to be a doctor is something that is extremely time consuming and takes a lot of energy, especially cognitive and mental energy. And as if going to medical school wasn't enough to take up all of that, I also decided that I was going to compete in beauty pageants, Miss America and um, Miss USA during medical school. And so I needed a way to optimize my energy, my productivity, And I had a really conveniently timed rotation in sleep medicine. And it was just so eye-opening. Some of the tips that we were talking about with patients, when I would do reading at home to study for it, the things that I was learning, and I was just like reading all these science words, and I was like, oh my gosh, how can I apply this to my own life um, to be more productive? And that rotation ended up being more helpful to me than it probably was to the patients. (laughs) And it was always really funny because when I was competing in pageants, that's really time consuming. You're doing charity uh, events, you know, probably 20 hours a week. And people would be like, oh my gosh, how do you do it all? You must never sleep. I was like, you could not be more (laughs) wrong. That is the secret. (laughs) That is my secret. (laughs) The secret is not that I never sleep, but actually that I sleep a very adequate amount and good quality sleep. Really? How did you make that happen? <laughs> well, we'll get more into that today. I have a lot of um, very easy, applicable uh, strategies that we'll get into. I just want to note, too, that if you're watching on YouTube, um, you'll you'll see why Danielle is a pageant queen. Um, <laughs> and if you're not, you should be because she is gorgeous. Oh, well, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And then after that initial sleep medicine rotation, it was kind of funny and probably a scheduling fluke, but I ended up having almost 12 weeks of sleep medicine rotation throughout my time during medical school and then also in residency, which is just actually an astronomical amount. uh, for just normal. Yeah, for general internal medicine, usually like someone who is going into a sleep medicine fellowship might have that much. Um, but for whatever reason, I got lucky and my schedule included that. And I was like, Hmm, this was meant to be. And I loved it. So, um, I just leaned in every time and got everything I could out of each educational experience. Yeah. I would love to know kind of from a scientific perspective and what you had learned, 
going back to the basics of why sleep is so important. I love this question because it's incredibly important and it gets at a lot of the things that are super scientifically interesting to me. Um, but to put it in, you know, normal language <laughs> instead of nerd language, <laughs> sleep is really important because overall it reduces the inflammation in your body and it repairs blood vessels. And while you sleep, your blood pressure actually goes down. And this is really important to reducing risk of heart attacks and stroke. Um, and actually in the Journal of Sleep Medicine, which is like, you know, a research uh, journal that's peer reviewed by the scientific community, uh, it shows that people who get good sleep, enough sleep, good quality sleep, overall live longer. Mm. And that people, specifically women with stress, are more likely to, to develop sleep problems. And so that tells us that stress and sleep problems lead to um, health problems mm -hmm. overall and an overall increased rate of mortality. Um, you know, other reasons that sleep is important is because it consolidates learning and memory um, and your cognitive function. So if you've ever felt like, you're just in a fog and you're forgetting things or you can't seem to keep your life together, it might be because you're sleep deprived. And sleep is incredibly important to brain health overall. Chronic sleep deprivation is actually associated with an increased risk of dementia later in life mm. and other cognitive um, impairments and things like that. And of course, it's Poor sleep is also associated with weight gain and diabetes and all kinds of health problems. Not to mention that you just feel like total garbage. Right. <laughs> I was going to say that. It's like, I don't even know if we need all these reasons, but I think people do push it off. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you know, you're moodier, you know, you mm -hmm. feel like crap, you know, you're less likely to work out if you're tired and you treat people poorly because you're so irritable. But then all of these things on top of like, I didn't know that was connected to dementia. Like that's super scary. Mm -hmm. That freaks me out. Yeah. yeah. When you sleep, there's this protein in your brain. It's called tau protein. And when you sleep, it clears it out. So it basically detoxes this protein out of your brain. Um, and we've found that in patients who have dementia, specifically Alzheimer's, they have higher levels of that protein in their brain. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, one could potentially say, these things are related somehow, um, and sleep gets rid of this protein that has been increased in people with brain diseases. So Interesting. That's, that's really cool too. Wow. So I know that with sleep, it's like, it's important to have a certain amount of hours and it's important also to have good quality sleep. I feel like there's a lot of different like ways to navigate how to get started. Like where do you kind of start when you're thinking about, I know I need to address my sleep? Um, so I think to first get into it, it's really important to understand more about sleep and how it works. Um, because when I was learning about the sleep stages and what the, how it benefits your body, that's when I kind of came up with these strategies and realized that, you know, how to make it work for me. Mm -hmm. So um, there's different stages of sleep and we'll kind of simplify it. I'll say like stage one and two, those are lumped together. So this is kind of your lighter sleep when you first lay down. You're feeling maybe kind of dozing. You're easily awoken though. And then stage two, which is lumped in, it's basically the same, but we would see brainwave changes if we were to hook your brain up to like an electrical monitor. These first two lighter stages, those are ideal for power naps. Mm. So um, you're usually in those stages for about 20 to 30 minutes. Something um, just to like weasel in a small fun fact of what I used to do on test days before, um, during medical school, is there something called a caffeine nap? Oh. oh. <laughs> and what you do is you drink a cup of coffee. Generally, the <laughs> onset of action for caffeine in a typical cup of coffee is about 20 or 30 minutes. Okay. So that's how long it takes for the caffeine to take effect. Oh. Well, also the ideal length of power nap is 20 to 30 minutes. Oh. So you just down a cup of coffee, take a power nap, and then when you wake up, it's like you double down. Um, because oh my gosh, I love that. Mm -hmm. So if I've, you need a jolt, that's a great strategy. <laughs> Light bulb. Oh, wait, can I get a nap right now? <laughs> I just drink a cup of okay, coffee. So pound a cup of coffee, take a 20 minute power nap. You're going to wake up double yeah, awake. Yeah. Um, 
because the way that coffee works is that it blocks this chemical, it's called mm-hmm. adenosine, that makes you drowsy, sleepy, brain fog. So coffee makes that chemical less active. And when you sleep, your body gets rid of that chemical. So now not only do you have less of that sleepy chemical because you just took that power nap, but you're also blocking that sleepy chemical that you have with your caffeine. So it's a little <laughs> I love that. That's that is what we call gold. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Um, so that's kind of like a fun way to increase your energy right away. But the meat of sleep, like where the magic really happens is during stages three and four. And stages three and four include the deep sleep. That's the, ret- the restorative sleep. This is like, have you ever taken a nap and you wake up and you're like, oh my God, what time is it? Uh, what where day am I? Is it? Yeah. Where <laughs> am I? Did yes. I oversleep? Am I supposed to be at work right now? <laughs> like, um, and it takes you some time to get your bearings. Maybe you feel groggy or like maybe even worse than you did before you laid down for the nap. Yep. Um, that means that you woke up during a deep restorative sleep stage. And then the other important part is rapid eye movement or REM sleep. And that's when you dream. So that one's kind of fun. And your body's also paralyzed, interestingly, during that time. Really? Mm -hmm. So question. I heard that if you're going to take a nap during the day, the best time or length is to do like an hour and a half so that you go through a full sleep cycle. So is it either do a 20 minute because you're not in that deep sleep yet, so you're not getting into full, or is it do a full sleep cycle? What's what's the answer? Both work. Okay. It depends on what your um, what your goal is and how much time you have. Um, the the point of the, those time guidelines is to avoid getting into that deep sleep or waking up during that deep sleep. So if you do the twenty to thirty minute power nap. Then you don't get into that deep sleep. You feel kind of restored. It's almost like you had a really good meditation or something. Um, But if you're genuinely sleep deprived and you need a restorative sleep, each sleep cycle, you're right, lasts about 90 minutes for the average person. There's some variation. So just be in tune with your body and kind of notice patterns about yourself and see, do I fit with this 90 minutes? Is mine a little shorter? Is mine a little longer? Um, but 90 minutes is usually a good place to start because then you go through those first 20 to 30 minutes of light sleep, you fall into the deeper sleep categories, stage three and four, perhaps you might get one cycle of REM in. And then after REM, you come back into those lighter stages, Mm -hmm. um, for a little while. And that's the best time to wake up. Okay. And that actually gets into another really good strategy for optimizing your sleep overnight. Because um, just like if you take a nap and you wake up during those deep sleep stages and you wake up super groggy and out of it, that can happen in the morning too. Um, Me every morning. (laughs) Yeah. You know, like when your alarm goes off and you're just like, I physically cannot move. Like even just slapping that like snooze button seems like- You're speaking my language. Like horrible, like the worst thing in the world right now. That means you're probably- getting woken up from a deep stage of sleep. And that can be remedied by shifting your sleep either forward or backwards. Okay. Um, Something that people often will notice is that they'll say, you know, I try to sleep eight hours a night, but I feel so much better if I only sleep five hours. Why is that? Well, it's not actually because you're sleeping five hours as opposed to eight hours it's probably more likely that um, you're getting rid of that that disconnect or like interrupted sleep mm-hmm. cycle. And you're probably waking up from a stage one, stage two. So you feel more energetic initially. That makes so much sense. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. And, um, you know, throughout the day, if you wake up in the middle of a sleep cycle, uh, like, like we've been describing with the naps or when the alarm goes off, your brain, its number one priority actually is to finish that sleep cycle. Literally, it will take up like your cognitive space and your bandwidth because your brain is just like, I need to finish, I need to finish, I need to finish. It it feels like it left this super important thing undone. Mm. And so yes, I can feel that. I like mm-hmm. I my brain tells me like that thought you're thinking of, my brain thinks 15 more minutes. 
Like it tells me you need 15 yeah. more minutes. It's not finished, but that makes so much sense. Cause that's literally, I think probably what it's doing. And if I get those 15 minutes, sometimes I'm like, yep. That, my brain told me that. Yep. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or like, you know, when you're at, at work all day or, you know, doing your daily routine and you're just like, I can't wait until I can go home and finally take a nap. That's probably because you're getting an incomplete sleep cycle. So for someone who would love to get this complete cycle and wake mm-hmm. up in stages one and two, how do you plan your night around that? Hour wise or where do you recommend beginning? Mm-hmm. Um, so first figuring out kind of what your sleep uh, cycle length is. 90 minutes is a good rule of, you know, to start with um, and kind of see how that works for you. So plan your night of sleep around 90 minute chunks. So, um, you know, two sleep cycles is like three hours. So six hours, um, add another 90 minutes, like seven and a half hours. Which is ideal anyway. You Mm -hmm. should be getting seven to eight anyways, right? I feel like they say seven to eight for a reason because seven 30 (laughs) is ideal. Exactly. And, um, a lot of times, you know, you get to that seven and a half and then you just allow for like 20 minutes or something to fall asleep. Um, so that's kind of where that guideline of eight comes from. Okay. Uh, you know, but that's not, that's not ideal for everyone. And you always have to listen to your body. I personally am probably someone that needs more like, you know, add another 90 minutes on top of that seven and a half, you know, so math nine, nine. (laughs) (laughs) I'm definitely like a nine plus, you know, like the 20 minutes to fall asleep type person. Other people genuinely can function off of like a sleep cycle less. Mm -hmm. You know, you just have to figure out what works for you. So now that you know what is the number of hours that you need to get complete cycles for you, you kind of plan backwards. Uh, Something I like to have people do is like, okay, imagine that you are on a paradise island. There's no work. There's no obligations. You don't have to like get up with your kids. You don't have anything. You don't have to make your yoga class in the morning. Like (laughs) there's literally nothing. There's no screens. You're just out in nature, relaxed. Imagine what time you would go to bed. And then imagine what time you would just naturally wake up and feel well rested. If you imagine yourself sleeping like 12 to 14 hours, when I say, (laughs) say imagine this like perfect scenario, that's probably a good sign that you are sleep deprived actually Mm -hmm. because your brain is like, oh my gosh, I need more sleep. I need it at any cost. Everybody's circadian rhythm, that's the first time I've used that term, that's kind of your body's internal clock. So everybody's internal clock is very different. Um, But society has this idea that we need to wake up and get started. Like all of our work always starts at like 8 a.m. or something. And you need to wake up at six or five to get stuff done. You need to go to bed early. Um, and that doesn't always work for everyone. Mm-hmm. So if you have a career um, or lifestyle that allows you to be flexible, I would actually encourage you to um, listen to your body and go to bed when your body tells you to go to bed and wake up when your body tells you to wake up. That's not always realistic mm-hmm. because we live in a society that has demands on us and sometimes we need to be flexible and meet those demands. And so um, say you start work at 8 and you want to be able to wake up at 6 a.m. to give yourself adequate time to get ready for the day. So now you do math and you'd say, okay, 6 a.m., I'm going to give myself seven and a half hours so I get, um, you know, right on the sleep cycle. You would do the math and figure out what time you need to go to bed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And make sure that you're like in bed at that time. Now, that's the easy part, even though it includes math. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Now, you need to tell your brain and train it to be sleepy at the right time Mm -hmm. and to wake up at the right time. So you're trying to wake up at six. So you're if you're so right now you're trying to get seven and a half hours of sleep. Yeah, we'll round it to eight to give you some grace period to fall asleep. So you want to be in bed by 10. So you're asleep by 1030. Yes. Okay. 
Got it. Perfect. I'm glad that you're like helping me with the math. Here. Like, <laughs> like some. I used to be really good at arithmetic, but it's like the more medicine I learned, the more like useful daily knowledge was etched out of my brain. Really? <laughs> well, you're just putting so much in it. It's like, hold yeah. on, I need time to process this all. <laughs> yes, and and so like calculating tips at at restaurants, doing math to figure out what time I need to do things. Those skills have left my brain. So I'm understandable. I feel very grateful. You have bigger fish to fry (laughs) with your patients. Um, So, okay. Now your math bedtime is 10. You need to do a ritual. Our brains want everything to be efficient. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have to think too hard about anything, actually. And your brain does so many amazing things. Um to just streamline and autopilot. And we can use that autopilot to optimize things like feeling tired and going to sleep. Mm -hmm. So you need to do a ritual before bed that that tells your brain, all right, I'm winding down. Mm -hmm. Yes. In order for your brain to feel sleepy at night, a few things need to happen. First, you have to have the right chemicals in your brain signaling that it's time to go to bed. One of those major players is called melatonin. Love it. Yes. (laughs) And melatonin is secreted or made in your brain when it is dark out Mm -hmm. or rather lack of light, especially blue light. We generally naturally get blue light from the sun. Mm -hmm. So before we had screens and artificial lighting, you know, humans probably slept a lot more you know, had much more healthy sleeping patterns because our only source of light was the sun. Right. And that's what our body evolved to follow. And so melatonin usually spikes if you have a good circadian rhythm that's nice and solid about two to three hours before bedtime, actually. So if you're really serious about um, resetting your bedtime, getting your sleep on track, That means no screens for two to three hours before bedtime. Which in today's society is like, uh, right? How? crazy. How do I function? I think people are like, I'll just wear my blue light glasses and then I won't have- Are they really that effective? You know, I think think they're a good compromise. Okay. You know, it's better than than just staring at the screen full glare right into your retinas of your eyes, you know, and Mm -hmm. your brain being like, yes, bright light. Yay. You know, (laughs) keep me up. Yeah. Let's see another TikTok, you know. Uh, (laughs) Guilty. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) But um, so blue light glasses actually are great. I would recommend blue light glasses if you absolutely cannot cut the screen time out. What about during the day? I know some people swear by their blue light during the day. Does that have any effect? That's a great question. So blue light during the day, um, you know, shouldn't really affect sleep per se. Okay. But other people are sensitive to blue light for other reasons, Mm -hmm. like migraines or eye strain or um, just kind of like mood or anxiety. Sure. Um, So if you feel like you're affected by blue light or screens in that sense, you could always try the blue light filter glasses. Alternatively, on most electronics now, there's usually apps or settings. Um, If you play around on your computer or your phone, you can usually find um, some sort of like nighttime mode. Yeah. And it will filter out the blue in the screen. It looks really weird at first and your screen is like totally orange and the colors are (laughs) off. But eventually you get used to it. And so that's another way to filter out the blue light. All right. So um, getting back into melatonin and signaling to your brain how to wind down for the night. Mm -hmm. Um, So that two to three hour range is important for other reasons too. So usually when you get that spike in melatonin, the light starts dimming, your brain starts thinking, okay, it's almost bedtime. If you think about your daily habits and what you do in the two to three hours before bed, what do we all do? For me, that's when I'm actually like, I'm cleaning my house, Mm -hmm. I'm planning for the week, I'm meal prepping. I'm doing all these really productive, really energy heavy things. And um, I need to practice what I preach a little bit better (laughs) because actually, if you want to optimize your sleep, that should be a wind down time. Meaning you should be doing something that's not super stimulating, ideally not with a screen, something that doesn't take a ton of mental or physical energy because your body just needs that time uh, to, to... Get ready, essentially, because sleep 
is actually such a complex physiological Mm -hmm. biochemical process that happens in your body that your body has to genuinely prepare for it. Yeah. Which is crazy to think about. Yeah. Well, and as a parent, that's like impossible because most parents get their kids home around 530 Mm -hmm. and they put their kids to bed at eight or 830. That's two and a half to three hours. Exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So in that window, you know, kids have homework, which is taxing on your brain. You have to use your brain. You know, parents are running them around. They're high stress. They're in traffic. They're picking up their kids. They're rushing around. They have activities. It's like, how do we even troubleshoot that as a parent, you know? Right. And you're going to get like deeper problems in like how our society is structured. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, American culture is is so fast paced and so focused on productivity, and a lot of the value that we derive it, as a person is from our work and what we produce throughout the day. And uh, that's why America is one of the cultures or countries that has the worst sleep health mm-hmm. and the most sleep deprivation and the most negative health effects from that, and mental health, and mental health mm-hmm. as well. Obesity, diabetes, heart disease, strokes, dementia. I mean, we we are not doing great health wise. <laughs> yeah, um, compared to to other cultures, um, even when they have fewer health resources than we do. And um, one of my opinions is that sleep has a lot to do with that. You know, when we look at other cultures that prioritize sleep more and actually will kind of base their societal scheduling more around sleep. They have much better health outcomes, much better mental health outcomes. They feel more connected um, with their family and mm-hmm. community relationships and are have higher rates of happiness, actually. I feel like there has to be a balance between this go, 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 the doing and the being, and everyone, not everyone, but society, we're lacking that just being and that recuperating, restoring so that we can do the doing. Yeah. And thinking exactly. of other cultures, I think about the siestas. Yes. Or yes. I think about how, like, like if you do go to Mexico, like resorts pretty much shut down from two to like six to go take a nap mm-hmm. or like different countries, you know, maybe they're like, okay, we can only do so much of not being productive. Mm-hmm. Like we do have to work, but then you get a longer holiday or like spring breaks. They could give you weeks off of work or months off of work, you know, and it's probably to, you know, catch up on your sleep, rejuvenate, reconnect, and f- even maybe strategize how to be productive and keep your sleep. You know, it's probably a good tactic. Yeah, exactly. I feel like I feel like we are coming from like a deprived state all the time. We're always trying to catch mm-hmm. up. And so um, something something that I've recommended to some of my friends, you know, we'll just be talking. And even though, you know, I'll just be like chatting as friends, they still ask me a lot of like medical questions. Mm-hmm. They'll be like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. I'm fatigued all the time. I have all these things I want to do, but I just like cannot muster up the motivation. And I'm always like, okay, how's your sleep? Mm-hmm. <laughs> there was like garbage, you know, because I'm up all night getting stuff done for the next day. And, um, I have to wake up early to be able to accomplish all the things mm-hmm. that I need to. And I will often tell my friends to take a week off to reset their, their works or their sleep schedule. If, if that's something that's available to them, if they have a job that's flexible enough for that. Um, because this actually, you know, we're getting into these strategies on how to train your brain, uh, when to sleep. And this take, this can take, you know, two or three weeks before your brain like starts solidifying these habits. So consistency is definitely going to be key here. Mm -hmm. And, um, like you mentioned, society sometimes doesn't let us have that two to three hours Mm -hmm. of winding down. One of the, uh, interesting consequences of not getting that two to three hours of leisure or relaxation time prior to sleep is something um, that I call like revenge insomnia. Mm, I just, yeah, I started seeing this all over social media. I'm intrigued. What is that? I I love that it's becoming more mainstream because your body needs that time to prepare for sleep so badly that it will actually push your bedtime or push your feelings of sleepiness back until you've had that time. It's like basically... Your day is devoted to doing 
everything for everyone else that when you get home and you are in bed, you're like, I want this time to do whatever the hell I want to do. So it won't shut down. Exactly. Perfect. So, so then once you finally get that like alone time or relaxation time, you know, it's probably when you should ideally be going to sleep, Mm -hmm. but that's instead when you spend a bunch of time scrolling on social media, maybe that's when you read, maybe that's when you do your beauty routine or your yoga or, you know, you feel, you fill it with your you time that ideally you should have had. I feel like you're speaking to every parent on the planet right now. You think that it's helping you because right now social media and health and wellness, right, is preaching this self-care, self-care. And there's a lot Mm -hmm. of people that can say, hey, this is my me time. This is my self-care time. So when am I going to fit it in? How do I fit it all in? Mm -hmm. Well, and that's the battle with the parent. It's like I've literally done everything to keep these kids alive and I've worked. Mm -hmm. And now I'm supposed to go to bed the second they go to bed. The, literally when is my time <laughs> yeah so the the only answer for me is yes go to bed when they go to bed set up I mean the kids have a bedtime routine we do it for them we mm-hmm. get them nice and sleepy we read them a nice book we get them all relaxed we get them all cozy and then what do we do for ourselves nothing so now I'm like okay I used to be a night owl and that used to be my time but now I'm like no because then I work out at night and then I'm up because that makes me extra awake so I just flipped it I'm like they're brushing and flushing. I'm brushing and flushing now. I've got my face routine then now. Thank you, Brooke, for helping me get that set up. Got you. <laughs> I face plan in my bed. I go to sleep when they do. And then I just get up two hours before them. And then that's my time. And so that's my fix. Like, that's the only answer I can come up with being a parent. Do you feel like you're getting enough quality sleep by waking up those two hours earlier? Now I do. Okay. Which I didn't think I would. But I do because... I honestly think it's because I have their bedtime routine now. Mm-hmm. I, I honestly become think your just, bedtime routine. Yeah, it has, <laughs> it truly has. I'm like using my kids routine to filter into getting myself. And like, those are my signals now and it's working. I feel more awake than I've ever felt. Mm-hmm. And I think you point out something that's really important to, especially women uh, who are often seen as the caretakers um, that we do so much for other people our kids, our loved ones, and then you don't do that for yourself. And so many times the answer is um, how you take care of everyone else should be how you take, take care, care of, of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so you you got it exactly right. You're, you're getting the kids all relaxed, <laughs> doing all their rituals, so they know, oh, this is bedtime. Mm-hmm. And, you know, by virtue of that, you've created a ritual for yourself as well. <laughs> I'm curious what your thoughts are on night owls versus morning early birds um i i think um if you have a flexible job that allows and you're a night owl and you're truly a night owl not that you're doing this revenge insomnia or Mm -hmm. this like procrastination you just notice that you work better yeah if you just notice that your cycle is a little bit later i think i think that's totally fine that used to be called um delayed circadian rhythm syndrome. So we used to define that as a sleep disorder. Interesting. But I don't like that. I think, um, I think that humans are just unique. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not going to all be uniform, even though we kind of have uniform societal obligations. And so I think that has less to do with what is internally wrong with someone in their sleep pattern and more to do with, uh, their individual needs aren't necessarily compatible with the needs of the majority of society or what uh, society expects of them. And so if you find yourself being a night owl, see if you can get a job that works with your schedule. Every once in a while, I have a schedule, uh, it's called swing shift. um, And I actually love it. So we start working at 3 p.m. And then our shift usually ends around 11 or 12 at night. And when I am on swing shift, I feel like a million bucks. Like (laughs) I, I go to work from three to 12. I come home. I have my like wind down time after work, usually end up going to sleep around like two. And then I wake up naturally, beautifully without an alarm clock at like 10 or 1030 in the morning. And I just feel so rejuvenated. Mm -hmm. I can work out. I can meal prep. I can clean my house. I can engage in some sort of hobbies before it's time to go to work at three. The only downside is, is that schedule is not what 
all of my friends and loved ones are on. So then it gets a little isolating. But, you know, I think about that all the time of like, you know, if we could only have more flexible schedules for people who kind of naturally have Mm -hmm. a, a delayed rhythm that would be perfect well Mm -hmm. you'd be more efficient in your work it's a a win-win like as long as you're getting your work done and it doesn't have to be in these hours yeah I mean it's tough when you have meetings that you have to align with other people or you have different time zones or whatever I I totally understand how you kind of have to but I can't imagine and I'm super excited because I have a vacation coming up I'm gonna try this just waking up not to an alarm which I know there's different ways you have a really cool alarm clock too but I want to hear about the alarm clock. Yeah. Is it a light one? Yeah. So um, (laughs) Sonia, who we had on the podcast, she uh, saw and and was listening to a different podcast we had where I talked about um, my relationship with the snooze button Mm -hmm. and how I set an alarm every minute. Just a very bad habit because getting out of bed is really hard for me. And so she recommended the hatch alarm clock where it's the light and then it also so the light starts coming on you can set whatever color light you want so I have it usually set at 4 30 it starts and then it's a slow rise so then at five I have the the chimes go off and then it does like a morning meditation that slowly gets me up is right it training now, you to become a monk like are you gonna be at a monastery <laughs> God, <soon>? I wish <laughs> um no the problem right now is that the woman's voice is so soothing that <laughs> it goes straight from like the chimes to her voice and then I fall back asleep to oh. it so I can't do that yet but there's also a night feature where I hit it it goes on at a certain time and then it walks me through um or it put, puts on a light first. It gives me 30 minutes of reading time, and then it does a night meditation, and then it goes into, like, a noise machine, a sound machine. And I still have to have it away from my bed so that it forces me to get up and turn it off. So it's, like, the it's slowly happening, mm-hmm. slowly getting to it. You need a chick on there that's like, yo, Brooke, wake up, it's time. You a badass. <laughs> wake up. <laughs> yeah. No, it's – but I think that what you're saying – about the 90 minutes and figuring that mm-hmm. out is super key and nothing or I haven't thought about that before yep because I wake up every morning just like oh which I know a lot of people do so yeah, yeah so it's a slow process mm-hmm. but it's happening and it's getting me into a night routine and a morning routine and setting up this perfect sleep environment mm-hmm. and I, I love that um, because that's using so many great scientifically based strategies, especially the, um, I like the noise machine mm-hmm. part of it. And so that gets me into, you know, now that you've had your time to wind down, you've done your nightly ritual, next is setting the stage or the environment for sleep. Um, you know, that means dark, no light, ideally no screens. I think, you know... The easiest first step is get that TV out of your bedroom. (laughs) And if you can, no laptop in the bedroom. And if you can charge your phone outside of the bedroom at night, do that too. And that's going to be the biggest thing for environment. Mm -hmm. And make sure the temperature is comfortable. Make sure the bed is comfortable. You know, all those decorative pillows, get rid of them, toss them, (laughs) throw them on the floor, you know. And, um... Something that, you know, an unpopular opinion is to not let pets sleep in Mm -hmm. your bed too, because they're rustling throughout the night. They wake you up. It's really fun and and amazing to cuddle them, but, uh, they do cause micro awakenings throughout the night and interrupt your sleep cycles. Definitely. And so creating a space for yourself where sleep is really the only thing that's associated Mm -hmm. with the bedroom Really, your bedroom should be for sleep and sex only. Literally nothing else. I like it. That's interesting, too, that you mentioned the phone because the phone even gets in the way of sex. Like, if the (laughs) phone goes off (laughs) and sleep. And so I know that you can, like, turn your sounds off on your phone, but, like, the light will come up on your phone Mm -hmm. if you don't flip it over. And so I need to get... A separate alarm clock, I think. Yeah, where do you find that happy... So for individuals who their job relies on it or, you know, emergencies, getting a whole... We don't have home phones now. What do you you say to that argument? You know, and, and that's kind of the piece of... You have to take all of this information with, like, what works for you? Yeah. Take... Take what works, leave the rest, you know, take what resonates, take what is realistic for you to use. Mm-hmm. 
you know, if you went ahead and did every single one of these tips that I'm sharing, you would be the most disciplined. Like <laughs> I'm trying. I would be like, wow, you are like hardly even human if you're able to actually follow all of this. I try, but you know, we're, we're all human and we all kind of like, yeah. you know, have our compromises. But if you're, if you're in a space where you're saying, I'm just sick of being tired. I'm sick of being fatigued. I want to make changes in my life that will improve my sleep and improve my health and my energy. Then these are things that you can think about yeah. if it works for you. Yeah. I love it. I love what you said too, is like, just take one tip. Mm-hmm. It'll make it better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Take a few. Take them all and man, hats off to you. But (laughs) I think that's the whole idea is that everyone has a different scenario. And Mm -hmm. so what works for you, try a few of these things. Try one of these things. I mean, and think about how it could apply to what you're doing now and, you know, your job. or Right. Like if you're a mom and you have interrupted sleep, that's not really something that you can work around. Griffin, night terrors, like you do what you can. But there's other tips that you can add in to help. Speaking of, can I pick your brain about night terrors? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's hear it. <laughs> yeah. So, well, my son, it, it's genetic. My husband has them. And my son, who's five, which I've heard and I'm really praying for, that you grow out of them, which I don't totally believe because <laughs> my, your hus- husband still has my husband them. <laughs> still has them. And it is really rare. He has night terrors like... My husband has them like once every six months, maybe. Mm -hmm. And they're wild and scary and he's screaming or he thinks there's something in the room. Um, But my son, I do notice as he's getting older that they are less frequent and I'm I'm noticing patterns if he's overly tired that they're worse. Um, But yeah, I just want to know like, what is that? Like what is going on and what can I do besides keep him on this routine of getting to bed at a normal time? Yeah. Um, oh, there's so many interesting points to this. So, um, night terrors or when you kind of like act out dreams, Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe screaming, fighting, whatever, that is actually your body failing to paralyze, um, your body or your brain fails to paralyze your body during the rapid eye movement. So basically you're like acting out dreams, nightmares, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, Generally, you don't remember most of your dreams, nightmares, that kind of thing, Mm -hmm. unless you wake up during the rapid eye movement sleep cycle. A lot of times if you're having night terrors, you're like getting out of bed, you're fighting, thrashing, whatever. And so you wake up and then you remember them and then it's very distressing and it can, it can negatively affect your sleep because it's like stressful. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's interesting that you notice uh, those patterns with your son that if he's more sleep deprived, Mm -hmm. uh, that they happen more often. Because that is a direct uh, cause of sleep deprivation. We have something called REM rebound. So it means that um, more of your sleep cycles are devoted to REM. Or you you spend more of your time in REM than you normally would had you been uh, not sleep deprived. And so he's having more of those opportunities for that uh, paralysis to fail. Um, It's a hard cycle because it's like... You're super tired because you had night terrors all night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then you're overly tired going to bed and then it's like he can't catch up on it. You know what I mean? It's like super hard. It's like we have to be so diligent with his routine and we're also super social people. So it's like Mm -hmm. sometimes we have people in our house and then they don't go to bed till 10 on the weekend or something. And it's, it's a really hard thing to stay disciplined with because of our lifestyle. And well, I've also heard too that you can't, like there's no such thing as catching up on sleep. No, you you really don't catch up. Um, I think over time you could um, kind of balance out or, or get back to a not sleep deprived state. But, you know, if you only sleep five hours a night all throughout the week and then you try to sleep in on a Sunday, mm-hmm. it ain't gonna do it. <laughs> you know, you... Uh, in order to catch up per se, you would need to have a disciplined sleep routine for weeks to months for your body to get used to that new sleep balance. And then, you know, maybe you could call yourself caught up because you're not sleep deprived anymore, chronically speaking. Mm -hmm. Not even just night terrors, but I know there's a lot of sleep disorders. I hear about them all the time with my Mm -hmm. coaching clients. Like, have you seen in your career, you know, any other sleep disorders? Definitely. Um, I'd say the most common one is probably sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. 
And that really negatively affects your sleep because uh, it affects your breathing um, and you don't get enough oxygen. You build up carbon dioxide in your body and then your brain actually wakes you up slightly, just enough to make you start breathing again. And so you have these kind of micro awakenings throughout the night. And so you don't get the deep restorative sleep that you need. You wake up, you feel super tired, like you might fall asleep during the day. Some people, it's so extreme, they'll fall asleep when they're driving or Mm -hmm. things like that. Um, So if you think that you have something like that, um, one of the main symptoms of sleep apnea is snoring. Or if your family members have sleep apnea, uh, that would be something that you should consider asking your doctor about. Like, hey, I'm really sleepy. I'm having these symptoms. I snore. Um, Do you think I could have sleep apnea? And you should talk to your doctor about it. And there's really easy testing now. Um, Sometimes they can even do sleep studies at home and give you a diagnosis. And usually if you diagnose and treat that, it's like a world of difference. What does that treatment look like? Uh, So the treatment for sleep apnea is, it's called positive pressure, uh, oxygenation basically. Uh, So it takes, it's something called CPAP. Mm -hmm. And so it's like this mask that you wear on your face. It creates a seal and it just kind of pushes air into your nose and mouth. And it keeps um, like your air tubes all nice and open. So you can continue to breathe throughout the night. Um, because when you sleep all your throat and like mouth muscles all relax and sometimes, you know, just genetically or bad luck wise, it'll be too narrow and kind of close off and block breathing Mm -hmm. for some people. So when you add some positive air pressure, it keeps it, um, like stented open so air can get in and out much easier. I have a few questions about sleep apnea. One, (laughs) I've heard that's really uncomfortable to sleep in. Is there any other alternative to that? Um, so the, the masks themselves have had a lot of innovations in the past few years. So, you know, if you or a family member has sleep apnea and you're like, oh, this mask sucks, like ask your, um, ask your sleep clinic if there's any alternatives because they'll actually like find a mask that really works for you. But if at all costs, the mask is just like, this ain't it. Um, there are other alternatives. They're a little less effective, but you know, probably better than nothing. There's like a dental like implant mm-hmm. that kind of like thrusts your jaw forward to keep um, that airway clear. Sometimes there's different surgeries that they can do actually. Mm. Um, but my favorite is definitely the CPAP. And if at all possible, just trying to find a mask that works and is comfortable enough. Because if you can get, if you can figure out how to fall asleep with that on and you just get like a few good nights of sleep, you're going to be like, oh my gosh. It's worth it. It's worth it. it. <laughs> yes. Yes. You'll be like, oh my gosh, I can't even sleep without my mask. Yeah. I want it, you know, because it makes such a big difference on how you feel the next day. Yeah. And then my mom might have it. She's unsure. And mm-hmm. so it's like getting the person to do the sleep study is hard. Like people just, <laughs> you know, time and it's money. And then yep. the machine sometimes costs money. So it's like, would I even be able to afford it? I don't know. But when we were at a clinic, I was with my mom and the doctor said, if you have sleep apnea, you are shaving off days and weeks and months of your life. You need to get this tested. And yes. it scared her because, mm-hmm. so I heard that and I was like, <gasps> I mean, I know sleep's important, but is this true? And so how do you feel about that statement? I agree with that. I actually, I'm like, oh yes, that's so powerful. I love it. Like I'm going to start incorporating that when I <laughs> talk to my patients about sleep and sleep apnea. Um, you know, kind of like getting back to what we started this talk with so many important things happen during sleep. And when you're not getting good sleep, your risk for heart attack, stroke, your blood pressure, your weight, your insulin management, your body, all of those things get worse if you're not Mm -hmm. sleeping right. And, um, you know, sleep apnea is one of those things that can negatively affect your sleep quality. One of the things you just said, you're mentioning all these different, like the insulin and all these different hormones and everything and weight. And I think something people are always asking us is how do I boost my metabolism? Sleep. <laughs> Get some, what does your sleep look like? It's usually like the biggest, like, yeah. And nobody wants to, but also it. no one talks about it. Mm-hmm. Like, this isn't really common knowledge. Yeah. And, and the way that sleep, um, can affect metabolism is there's multiple ways, <laughs> but the main ways are first, um, Insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. This is something that causes weight gain and it causes type two diabetes. Um, And if you are sleep deprived, you're more likely to have insulin resistance. So therefore, if you get good sleep, your body manages insulin better, manages its blood sugar better, manages your metabolism when you weight better. So that's, that's one way. 
The other way is, you know, when you don't get enough sleep, your body tries to conserve its energy and it uses it for only the most vital survival um, activities, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so we have so many different parts of our brain. And I like to call like your survival part of your brain, your lizard brain, because it's like a lower form of your brain and like reptiles have this part of your brain. This is the brain, the part of your brain that says, I need to eat. I need to sleep. I need to, um, rest and digest, rest and digest. (laughs) Sometimes, you know, like sex drive is associated with that part of the brain, but we, as humans, we have evolved, um, another more powerful part of our brain called the frontal cortex. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially where all of our higher level thinking and regulation comes from. That's the part of your brain that says, I know I'm sleepy right now, but I need to finish this thing real quick. Um, I know that I'm hungry um, and I will get food soon, but I can do this. It's what emotionally regulates you. It allows your reasoning. Yes, it's your reasoning. And when you are sleep deprived, you know, your frontal cortex takes so much energy. Mm -hmm. So when you're sleep deprived, that part of your brain is much less functional. And so not only are you not going to be as good at remembering things, learning things, cognitively functioning, but you're also going to be much more impulsive because now your lizard brain is like, eat, 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 whatever's in sight. I need food. I'm going to die. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Your lizard brain is going unchecked. There's no frontal higher level brain saying, I know you have these needs and we'll get to them. And instead you're just like chips. Yeah. Food. And you're much more likely to um, like make poor health decisions regarding what you eat. It's okay to be hungry and it's okay to eat when you're hungry. But when you're sleep deprived, you're more likely to grab the quick option. I think about relationships too. You're quicker to say hurtful things. You're quicker to react to Right, you're not pausing and actually thinking about what you are going to say and its effects. So that gets into a really fun fact actually about um, good quality sleep and appropriate amount of sleep is that people who reported poor sleep were much more likely to argue with their significant other the next day. And people who have good quality sleep and adequate sleep are more likely to report happiness within their marriage. So is that why my boyfriend is so nice to me? Because he's obsessed with sleep. It, it might be. great sleep. <laughs> it's definitely I'll part of it. it. Definitely I'll, res- to the I'll respect his sleep wishes now. <laughs> now I get it. Um, another point too, you know, if we're interested in how sleep and relationships intertwine, uh, couples that have the same bedtime or go to bed at the same time Uh, report higher levels of relationship satisfaction. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, even if one person is a night owl and one person is, um, prefers to go to bed early, even if the night owl will like lay down with the early uh, bedtime person and stay there until the the earlier person um, like dozes off, uh, that actually releases a lot of attachment hormones, um, you know, the love, the happiness hormones and, uh, relationship satisfaction is increased when you go, when you have the same bedtime. I heard too that this like cuddle hormone or whatever Mm -hmm. gets released and your heartbeat starts to, your rhythms start to beat together. Have you heard that? Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know if they, they necessarily beat together. I haven't heard that part, but I could imagine that that would definitely, like that could definitely happen because you're right that it affects your, Mm -hmm. your heart rate. Um, it can slow it down. And that's another thing that leads to better sleep is a slower uh, heart rate. Um, it's something that melatonin does. It's something that having that like wind down period mm-hmm. at night has. Um, it's something that happens naturally in the sleep cycles. So, you know, that could definitely be playing They're into it. They're both slowing down at the same time. Yeah. Makes sense. Dun, you're, dun. you're in sync, you know? Yeah. That's nice. If you're having trouble with interrupted sleep, say you're waking up multiple times during the night. Something that's good to know is that it's actually normal to have um, light awakenings up to 10 times a night. Okay. Sometimes people will will wake up that many times in the night. A lot of people don't remember it. So everyone wakes up, has micro awakenings throughout the night. It's when you uh, are between the sleep cycles. So you probably wake up, you know, about every 90 minutes, but you don't really remember it. Some people do, however, remember it. And it can actually be kind of distressing because you're like, why am I awake? I want to be asleep. 
Um, so sometimes just knowing that it's normal. Oh, you, so you just kind of notice, I notice that I'm awake and I would like to be asleep. Okay. Now you can move on, put your, you mm-hmm. know, put your mind to rest, but sometimes it goes beyond that. And some strategies for if you are awake and just cannot get back to sleep. A lot of us will just lay in bed and like stare at the ceiling, try to count sheep, <laughs> um, like try to will ourselves back into mm-hmm. sleep. And that often doesn't work. And sometimes that can actually worsen the problem. Because you're stressing about it. Because you're stressing about it. And because like we mentioned before, your brain wants to um, put things on autopilot. So if you're creating this habit where you're laying awake in bed, stressing out, Mm -hmm. now your brain is like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. Yes, I do this every night. So I will put this autopilot on repeat and I will do this every night. So if you're waking up in the middle of the night, you're having a hard time going back to sleep, you should actually leave your bedroom. Mm. Get up, go in a different room, do something, you know, kind of comfy, low stimulation, maybe like read a book with very dim lighting, something that's kind of boring, you okay. know, until you feel sleepy again. And then you go back in your bedroom to sleep mm. um, because you do not want to associate being awake and being stressed out with being in the bedroom. Um, one word of caution, when you choose your activity to do, do not choose anything rewarding, mm. you know? So if you're waking up at night and you're like, okay, I'm laying awake here. Um, I'm supposed to leave the bedroom. I think I'll pack my, my lunch for work tomorrow <laughs> because then, um, you know, I'm going to be all set up for my day. You're going to pack your lunch and you're going to get like a little reward. Hit a dopamine. Yes, exactly. And then your brain's going to be like, Ooh, I like that. I, I like that reward. So now guess what? Your brain's going to be like, Hey, I'm going to pack my lunch every yes, day at time 4 to <laughs> wake up and pack that lunch because remember how good that felt to like get prepared for the next day. Now you're perpetuating the cycle. So you need to choose something incredibly boring, uh, not rewarding. Interesting. Um, but it totally makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But what, it, like, so what if you choose meditation that's boring, that's relaxing, but it's got the blue light and it does give you a benefit. You could do a meditation that doesn't include a screen, right? Yes. Okay. That's what I would recommend. Okay. Maybe something with audio only, or if you, you know, sometimes you, you could maybe memorize like mm-hmm. a short meditation or a self-guided one. Or um, square breathing even. Would yeah. you recommend that you stay in bed to do the meditation or that you get out of your room to do the meditation? I would still recommend getting out of the room so you don't associate being awake in the middle of the night with, okay. with being in the bedroom. And then the minute you get sleepy again, just yep. go back to bed. Then go back to bed. And then should we talk about morning routine? Please. Because we talked a lot about bedtime routine and I think that morning routine is actually almost more important than your bedtime routine to setting your circadian rhythm. Okay. Um, so how do we wake up? So ideally you should wake up when you're in those stages one and two or between stages. Um, that's when you're in the lightest level of sleep, you should wake up. That's when you feel the most well-rested and alert. I love that you use that alarm clock that has the light Mm -hmm. because one of the most important signals to our brain that it is time to wake up is light and especially sunlight. Mm -hmm. And That is really powerful to setting your circadian rhythm. So it's like, this is our number one. And if you wake up, you know, we live in Minnesota where it's super dark out until what, like 9 a.m. or something. Um, So there are strategies to kind of get around that. And that's why I love the use of a light alarm clock. Or there's these things called sad lights. Um, They were originally invented for a seasonal depression. Mm. But we found that they're really effective in helping people with delayed circadian rhythm or trouble waking up or if you're trying to solidify your sleep schedule. So when you wake up in the morning, if you turn on this really bright light, a sad light, it's called S-A-A-D. Can I get this on Amazon? Yes, you can. (laughs) You can actually. And um, one specification that I would add is that you should get something that says 10,000 lux. Okay. It basically is a measurement of how bright the light is. And that's the one that um, mimics the sunlight in the spectrum of light that you would receive from the sun. 10,000. Okay. 10,000 lux. Yeah. Something I do too, because I heard this too, that you want to have the brightest light you can in the morning. Because that's Mm -hmm. exactly what it's doing is I cannot see myself. I don't want to track my REM sleep. I just, as much as I know that that's going to be helpful, I feel like that's going to change based off of when my kids wake up, if Mm -hmm. they wake up in the middle of the night. And I just know like whether I feel great or crappy, I need to be up 
at 5 a.m. or <laughs> earlier to get things done that I think I just choose to focus on the light. Like mm-hmm. I have a really bright light in my workout room and that tends to work for me. Does that make sense that that's just what I put in my face right away? Yes. Okay. You instinctually like got one of the best strategies for solidifying a wake up time. Okay. Um, because light is the most powerful signal to your brain mm-hmm. as to when you should be awake and when you should be asleep. It's so powerful actually that people who are born blind have a lot of trouble with circadian rhythm and they have a lot of sleep uh, problems because they don't sense light in the same way. Yeah, that makes sense. So bright light right in the morning. I would recommend probably like an hour of bright light right in the morning, right when you wake up, kind of like off to the side of your face at like 30 degrees. (laughs) It's so specific and it probably doesn't matter that much, but that's what was used in the most research, in most research studies. So that's kind of what we base it off of. Interesting. This has got me thinking about next step because the alarm clock, I love it, but I need something else. So I've been thinking about this lately. So it's funny that you say that of, okay, so my alarm clock goes off. I sit up, I wait a minute before I turn it off. Cause usually I'll get up, turn it off and immediately crawl back in bed <laughs> and then have an alarm every minute. But so I'm thinking, and I've been thinking about this for the last couple of weeks or so. So it's funny you say that is getting up, sitting up, waiting a minute, telling myself a mantra turning my alarm clock off. And then the cue of turning the alarm off is to immediately turn on my nightlight so that I have some sort of light. So I need to build that habit. But I think that if I purchase this SAD light, it's going to get me jacked. Mm -hmm. I just keep purchasing things (laughs) to help. (laughs) One of these has to stick. And, um, you know, it's really about consistency. Yeah. Discipline. You know, it's about training the autopilot part of your brain. Yeah. So your brain gets on this very regimented schedule. And so it will take over. If you stick with this habit, eventually you won't even have to think about it. It's the goal. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. And especially, you know, and you're having such trouble with the alarm clock. Once you get um, to a point where your sleep cycles are lined up in a good way, where you wake up kind of naturally at like a good Mm -hmm. Uh, transition point in the cycles. And if you're not chronically sleep deprived, the ideal thing would be that you wake up with the light signal and you won't even need an alarm. Mm. I can't even imagine. It's the end goal. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, I've, I've probably achieved that in my life for like maybe like a six month period of time (laughs) before life takes over. And you know, it's, it's hard to stay consistent and and stay on top of these things, but especially for you, you're a doctor with changing (laughs) schedule. Like I can't imagine. And I have a lot of clients that have that shifting schedule Mm -hmm. and they go from these hours to these hours. So how do you adapt that? Like, how does that work for you? Right. And so, you know, if you can't, if you realistically can't go to bed exactly at the same time every day, wake up at exactly the same time every day, you can still use these strategies to kind of manipulate your sleep time to, you know, maybe it's, maybe you're not that tired. Maybe it's not your normal time to go to bed. You can do your sleep routine. You can use these strategies to try to get as good of sleep as you can realistically in the period of time that you're allowed to sleep. And, um, that will allow you to at least get better quality sleep within the time allotment that you're, you're given. So, you know, if you can line up all of these things on top of each other and get the best, most optimized sleep, that's great. If you can apply a few of these things and just make small changes that make you feel better, then that's great too. Yeah. I feel like they're just these simple strategies that you can implement whenever. And the more you do them, the more your brain is associating it and we'll remember it. So even if you fall off track, it's easier to get back on because you've been consistent before your brain recognizes it. Exactly. And you can use these signals to your brain to, to change the schedule essentially, you know, like when I go to a new schedule and I have to start waking up two hours earlier, then I'll probably use the light more, you know, the light Mm -hmm. strategy, because then my, my brain will be like, Oh, I'm supposed to be awake now. And it's kind of funny in a lot of our work rooms, uh, as residents, we actually have the, the sad lights in the work room. Oh, really? So that's part of my routine. Actually at one of our hospitals, I go in the work room, I, I chart all my patients. I look at their vitals and their labs from the day before. And I have that light on. And when I'm at that site that has those lights, I feel so energized. And it's when my sleep schedule falls into place the best because I associate 
that mm-hmm. signal because I don't actually own one of these lights on my own. I really intend to purchase one, but I'll let you know how yes. how I feel about <laughs> it, how it works. And and I've I've been just mooching off the ones that we have yeah. at work, and it's been yeah. working for me. But um, you know, if I ever changed, you know, work sites or something, I probably would invest in my own because it really has made such a big difference. Yeah. And I love that there's all these little things that you can do to trick your brain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Little hacks, yes. So I'm really getting into my morning routine and. I'm getting obsessed with it. So I know that it's working. I'm feeling the benefits. And right now I'm playing around with when to have coffee. I've read things that are like, wait 30 minutes. No, it's fine. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I love coffee. And um, recently it was my favorite research article ever in a medical journal. (laughs) That makes me sound really nerdy. But (laughs) in the New England Journal of Medicine this summer, there was an article about caffeine and coffee and basically like, all the amazing health effects of hey. coffee. Basically, you live longer, you co- you function cognitively better, lower rates of cancer. It's just like, oh my gosh, how like this is amazing. And you can run a marathon faster. Yes. <laughs> that wasn't necessarily in this article, but I have I have heard that and it's true. Um but to get out when the best time to drink your morning coffee. So one of the signals that your body has to wake you up is something called cortisol. Mm -hmm. So this is a hormone that often gets a bad rap for being the stress hormone, but it's actually really helpful in your body in a variety of ways and it's necessary. And one of its necessary functions is that it spikes in the early morning, uh, not too long before you wake up, maybe a few hours before you wake up. And that's what tells your body, all right, it's time to get jazzed. Like bring that heart rate back up, bring that blood pressure back up, wake this brain up, let's go. And so that's spiking kind of right as you're waking up. So if you drink coffee on top of your cortisol spike immediately, like you roll out of bed and you drink that coffee, you probably won't feel that coffee effect as much. And over time, your body could come to rely on the caffeine more and it could decrease your cortisol spike. Um, not, not significantly, but it, it might, you might feel the energy differences. So the best time to drink caffeine actually is when you have cortisol lows. And those times often, if you have like a typical sleep schedule, would be mid-morning, like 9 or 10 a.m. Mm. And also mid-afternoon. So you know when you're like at work or something and it's like 2 or 3 and you're mm-hmm. just like, oh my gosh, I need a nap. That's because your cortisol is low. And so those those times when it's dipping are when caffeine will have the most positive effect um, on your energy and it won't change what your cortisol spike is. So it won't affect what your energy is like mm-hmm. um, based on that. That's so. so interesting. So hold on. Let me unpack that. Uh-huh. <laughs> if I wake up at 5 a.m., I have to wait four hours to have a cup of coffee. So, um, well, 5 a.m., that's a little earlier than than like my default scheduling that I'm thinking. So I would say you would probably have your coffee around like 7 or 8. That makes sense to me, though. That makes total sense to me because I wake up, I'm pretty much blacked out. I walk to my basement, turn on the bright lights, and I get into exercise, which yeah. gives me that boost. So it's like if you get your heart rate up with exercise first, mm-hmm. if you can. Get some endorphins Get flowing. some endorphins. Get that from that. Because I noticed that, too, that if I have a rest day with exercise, like I don't wake up and instantly think I need coffee that moment yeah. unless I stayed up way too late or something. But that makes total sense, like around that 9 to 10, that if I already had that boost – then I get a lull a couple hours later. Mm-hmm. I'm going to try that. So like yeah. three hours after you wake up, you would yeah, wait? Yeah, like two or three hours. Okay. Um, usually the routine, how I incorporate that into my routine is um, I wake up and I get ready for work, eat breakfast, if it's a good day, <laughs> um, drive to work. And then I have my first cup of coffee like as I get to work. And that tends to be kind of right where that low period is. Okay. okay. On the opposite side of that, when do you recommend stopping drinking caffeine? Caffeine, uh, for most people, will stay in your system for probably about four to six hours. Okay. Um, However, there are a lot of genetic variations in caffeine metabolism. So some people metabolize caffeine much faster, and these people are more likely to be addicted to caffeine and have high levels of caffeine intake. Mm. Um, And that's actually why sometimes in families you'll see like, 
the mom drinks like a pot of coffee <laughs> every morning, like my mom does. Mm -hmm. And now I'm noticing as I'm becoming <laughs> like into my older adult years, I'm like, oh, I need a lot of coffee to function. So, um, you know, this is another example of the, there's kind of a generalized time of four to six hours, but you need to pay attention to what yours is. Mm -hmm. And so for some people, it is okay to drink caffeine during that afternoon low that we were talking about. But for other people, it's not. And the caffeine will stay in their system long enough to negatively affect their sleep uh, that night. So I would recommend, you know, if you're having a hard time sleeping or if maybe you're feeling like your sleep uh, quality isn't great, see if you can go without the afternoon caffeine and, and just see how it affects you. And see you. how that affects mm -hmm. you. And would you want to wait like that two and a half hours before bed to have it be out of your system by that point or by the time you're falling asleep? Oh, good question. Oh, that is a really good question. Um, probably before, like, you know, probably the two to three hours during your wind down time because you probably shouldn't have caffeine or stimulants in your in your system while you're trying to wind down. You know, I think for me personally, when I, when I try to do that, um, I do get probably better sleep, but I think when I have the afternoon caffeine, it doesn't make a significant difference to me. And I'm like, okay, my quality of life is so much better <laughs> if I have like a 2 PM coffee. And so that's what works for me. So I encourage you guys to just kind of like, you know, play around with it, give it a few weeks without caffeine in the afternoon, see how that works for you. Um, if it doesn't make a difference, then, you know, enjoy what you enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Just become aware and in tune with how it affects you and exactly. go from there. And your relationships, because if you're super grumpy, it might be worth it to have a little bit of caffeine. <laughs> right. And actually, you know, while you're making this change, caffeine withdrawal is really common. Yeah. So if you're, if you're making the change... Give yourself at least like two weeks before you say, okay, this isn't working because you might just be experiencing caffeine withdrawal, which is hard to deal with in itself. And slowly wean off of it if yeah. you notice that you're getting crazy headaches. Exactly. Well, I just want to be mindful of your time and our listeners time. I mean, we could go on for hours. This has been fantastic. <laughs> yes. So thank you so, so much. We're so grateful that you're here with us today. Do you have any last comments, any wrap ups? Um, well, first of all, I'm just so happy that you invited me to talk about this because I'm sure you can tell I love talking about it. Uh, but I guess my, my wrap up would be, you know, everyone is completely unique and has different health needs, has different sleep needs, has different demands set upon them. And so when you're listening to this, pick out what works for you and see if you can apply it. And, you know, things like this actually have really great like repeat value. So if you listen to this today and you say, oh my gosh, okay, I can apply these few things. That's what works in my life right now. And then if you listen to this in a few months, you might be in a completely different space and you can get new things from it and you can apply different things and different strategies. And so I really encourage you on your health journey, you know, to do that with, with every, you know, every strategy or optimization approach that you take, figure out what works for you try different things. If it doesn't work, throw it out. If it works, then keep it and, um, you know, improve your life. Absolutely. I love that so much. And so that you don't forget to revisit in a couple months, <laughs> don't forget to hit subscribe <laughs> so that you never miss an episode and that you can always revisit the episodes. Um, well, thank you so much yes, before we jump into our three gold stars. Um, please, please remember that all of our resources are available to you for free at all of our social channels. Uh, with that being said, if our listeners want to reach you, where can they find you? Yeah. So the social media that I'm most active on is Instagram. My Instagram name is at Danielle, the doctor, D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, the doctor. Uh, so you can follow me there, but I don't really post a lot of things about <laughs> health or my profession. I actually... You know, I keep it pretty real. So if you're interested in getting to know me more just as a regular person or seeing what the normal life of a doctor is like, go ahead and follow. But I don't I don't uh, share a whole lot of health stuff. It's yeah. more just fun and hobbies and kind of like a regular person. It's so refreshing, though. I think <laughs> it's so nice to see that doctors are real people. They have hobbies that you might not think, like... You never know. Like, I mean, you'd look at you and know that you're beautiful, but you know, you don't know if someone's in a pageant or something like that. It's so interesting to see like what you're up to and that 
you are a normal human being that struggles with things like everybody else and you're taking steps to optimize your sleep just like we need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Totally. Well, Daniel, we wrap up our show with our last three segments. Mm -hmm. So the first segment is our three gold stars. Mm -hmm. So these are three actionable takeaways that we can give our listeners. So without further ado, it is now time for three gold stars. (laughs) (laughs) So the first gold star is that you need time to wind down at night. Your body needs time to prepare for sleep. And so take two to three hours at night uh, to make sure that you are incorporating leisure and relaxation because rest is just as important as productivity is. You can't have one without the other. (laughs) The second gold star is to create a bedtime ritual routine, whether that's beauty routine, meditation. um, And in that routine, I would recommend getting rid of screens if you can and reducing artificial light and really getting into the environment in which you sleep and creating that, that routine, that ritual, that space that tells your brain, all right, I am ready for a great night of sleep. (laughs) And the third gold star being um, focusing on your morning routine, figuring out where your sleep cycles naturally are at their lightest or at their transition periods using that 90 minute um, time frame so that when you wake up, you are feeling alert, not groggy or disoriented and really optimizing this for you and customizing a sleep plan for yourself. Love it. Oh, they're so great. All right, next up, unleashing Ivy. So these are our rapid fire questions. Mm. So first thing that comes to mind could be a word, a phrase, first (laughs) thing that comes. All right, first one. How do you create awareness around your quality or quantity of sleep? The first thing I notice is how easily do I get out of bed and how many times do I need that snooze alarm? I think you and I share (laughs) share that that problem. (laughs) Um, So if I'm really doing good, I actually will wake up like 10 minutes before my alarm is set. Ooh. And my, my alarm is more of a safety measure mm. than, uh, you know, something that I rely on. And if I'm not doing so great, then man, that alarm goes off and I can't even move. And I just <laughs> let that alarm keep going because even like reaching and clicking snooze is like so, so much, much work. work. <laughs> So that's a really good gauge for me to know, am I applying these strategies um, in a way that's helpful for me? What do I need to adjust? Yes. All exactly. right. Love it. Next one. When you realize your sleep schedule is up, what's one thing you do that steers you in a positive direction? Mm. Definitely the screen time, because that's the thing that sneaks up on me the most. I, My biggest mistake is I do that uh, revenge insomnia thing. I'll go, 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 um, clean my house, make dinner, work out late into the evening. So then when it's actually time for bed, I, it's actually when I start my wind down time and my wind down time for me is social media, (laughs) watching TikTok, watching TV, you know, it has everything to do with screens. So if I notice that my sleep schedule is getting out of whack, that's the first habit that I have to get rid of is the late screen time. Love it. All right, and last one. What's one thing you wish you would have known sooner? <laughs> you know, it's it's funny because I I feel like I've prioritized sleep really my whole life without having the scientific understanding. I just kind of intuitively knew this is incredibly important. My parents were super strict with bedtime. Like my entire life literally until I graduated high school, my bedtime was 9 PM. (laughs) And I think it had everything to do with my success. You know, I was pretty decent at athletics. I was good at school. Um, you know, I was involved in, you know, creative things and extracurriculars. And I continued that productivity and, um, you know, was really proud of my accomplishments and my energy level well into college and adulthood. And, it was probably because of the discipline that I kept around sleep that was instilled by my parents. And I'm really grateful that they did that for me. So, um, you know, I, 
I, I feel like I just intuitively knew this. Mm-hmm. I would have loved to know all of the scientific and like fun facts and how to optimize like caffeine and like the caffeine power naps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Some of those things, those, you know, little things that make me have a deeper understanding of the scientific biochemical physiologic reasoning behind sleep. Um, but intuitively I just, I knew early on. That's so, awesome. <laughs> wow. um, not, not much earlier could have I kind of found this, this life hack. <laughs> Very cool. All right. And our last segment today is your piece of gold. So this is a quote that you'd like to leave our audience with. Our piece of gold is from Maria Popova. We tend to wear our ability to get by on little sleep as some sort of badge of honor that validates our work ethic. But what it is, is a profound failure of self-respect and of priorities. This is Gold Ivy signing off. Listen to your truth and go chase your gold. (laughs) I love it.